Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. We are in the middle of the day on Thursday. Market is open. It's really, really, really flat in the market, so kind of boring. I'd, I'd like to think it may end up that way today. Um, and then we'll see where things go Friday. But as of right now, and I'm a little surprised by this, frankly, but markets are up uh, nicely here on the week. And uh, much more so in the S&P than the Dow. There was one particular stock that was holding a lot of the Dow average back. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it, it's not a week you would have really expected markets to have moved higher. Um, you, you had news that really shouldn't have affected markets, but it has mostly been kind of negative just in terms of broad news cycle. And, and yet the markets have kind of moved forward, and they haven't had a real positive catalyst either. There hasn't been any significant macroeconomic news that's come out this week. Um, you know, we've known and continue to know, and there's been no change around the fact that the Fed is sitting tight. Uh, earnings season's well done, and that doesn't pick up again here for another month. So it's a pretty slow time in general. And unless there's some interruption in the news cycle and things like the the airline safety stuff that's come up this week, the big college admissions scandal thing, you know, these aren't real marketive, market sensitive uh, events. Um, and so in terms of why markets have gone higher, your guess is as good as mine. Other than, you know, I think there is a generally favorable backdrop around U.S. assets right now. I think that the climate is such that even with this really significant move higher that we've had since 2019 began, that, uh, you know, the, the economic news is mostly healthy, <clears throat> and therefore people are not playing into fears about earnings recession and things like that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to try to give you viewers of our weekly video a lot of the same information I provided this week at DividendCafe.com, where we do our kind of flagship weekly, monthly writing. And I did cover a lot of topics there this week. It's an issue that I am particularly happy with. There's a lot of charts. Um, but what I did is I took four or five different, seemingly different subjects and really kind of brought them all together. Let me do some of that for you now. You know, the uh, issue of CapEx is something I've talked about, if not every week, certainly most weeks, for over a year. And I anticipate it will be another year or more that I continue to talk about it. And that is the capital expenditures uh, growing out of corporate America, the need to see capital expenditures growing. And by capital expenditures, I mean business investment, not spending for the sake of spending, but legitimate uh, capital investment in hard capex, structures, equipment, that drive productivity higher in the business sector of the economy. And I believe that the trade war is going to have to be uh, resolved before we can get the business confidence necessary to see this accelerate. But one of the things I did in an article I wrote this week at our marketepicurean.com uh, property, which is kind of a little higher level, it may, it, it's uh, meant to be a very purposefully uh, more severe treatment of the subject, but I delineate between hard capex and soft capex, meaning uh, hard capex, those expenditures that are in things like property and equipment and structures, heavily focused around the energy, industrial, and material sector, versus what you might call soft capex, which is still capital expenditures and still driven towards business investment and growth, but is more maybe on the R&D side or technology, software, intellectual property, things of that nature. Uh, look, all of uh, soft and hard CapEx, when it is a viable business investment, drives economic growth. But I believe it's the hard CapEx item that has suffered through this particular deficit. And that is where we think the trade war um, last year ran into a rough patch with stabilization of oil prices. That's been largely uh, improved upon so far this year. Uh, rising interest rates had an effect on capital projects, uh, as credit markets may have been more constricted. So you ran into a couple of interruptions to the growth we were starting to see in hard capex, and uh, that's the the theme that we're looking to now, and that why we're so excited for the trade war to hopefully be resolved. Okay, so then let's say 
that you get this resurgence in capital expenditures, where capital expenditures had been the worst post-recovery of any period since World War II. Now, all of a sudden, those get back to some sort of trend line level of growth. Um, for indeed, they had started to pick up. We're at a, the highest spot we had been late 2017 into mid 2018. We're at the highest spot we had been in about 20 years. And we continue to see a CEO survey response that they more than half anticipate growing, not shrinking their capital expenditure plans. So then what does that do? Well, if that does lead to this greater confidence in long-term sustainable growth in the economy, then I think you see the yield curve finally steepen. And the yield curve has been very, very flat. Right now, I think 90-day treasuries are at about 2.45%, and 10-year treasuries are about 2.62%. So from basically tomorrow all the way through 10 years, the amount of yield on those debt instruments is basically the exact same, a tiny bit higher as you go along. Um, all the way up to 30 years, by the way, is only at 3% right now. So it's only 50, 55 basis points higher to loan the government your money 90 days versus 11,000 days. So um, that's a byproduct of one thing and one thing only. Short-term rates rose when the Fed brought the Fed funds rate higher and have kind of been anchored there. But long-term rates have not risen because the confidence in long-term sustainable economic growth is not there. This increased CapEx, we think, would help to uh, steepen that yield curve, which then has an impact, by the way. Uh, it both creates and reflects better economic conditions, the so-called virtuous cycle. So that's where a lot of this connectedness comes from. Well, what, are, what else is going on in the world? I mean, are we really to believe that the only thing we're sitting around waiting on is trade war resolution, which then allows better business confidence, which allows better business investment, which drives productivity, which steepens the yield curve, so forth and so on? Is that the only thing going on? Well, the Brexit issues this week, uh, Prime Minister May's proposal, which he actually did get the European Union to sign off on, but couldn't get our own parliament to sign off on. Uh, that failed. And so uh, there's a hard deadline on March 29th. Um, they, uh, that's what the date is actually there in their, I believe it's Article 50 treaty, where they announced their exit from the European Union. So they either are going to have to vote to extend that, or which is what I suspect will happen, and you'll end up getting a soft Brexit where uh, the UK ends up having a relationship with the European Union that looks a lot more like Norway's. Um, you may end up uh, actually having the kind of political toxicity of a whole new referendum vote. I don't think that would be good. And then you may get a hard Brexit, which would probably elevate volatility in the short term, and I think long term would be actually splendid, but I'm not sure if any of them have the guts to do it. We'll see how that plays out with Brexit. Uh, what else did I want to talk about this week? I have a couple charts at Dividend Cafe really showing you why I think the Fed waved the white flag in early January, why their hard language about continuing down a path of monetary tightening and a path towards normalization of monetary policy, why they reverse course so dramatically. And both of the charts refer to conditions in the credit market, one showing that commercial and industrial loan access had severely tightened, uh, according to survey respondents, and one showing uh, increase in the spread of cost of funds in the bank loan market. And I think that that data reinforces the fears the Fed were beginning to have. And, and so that might be worth taking a look at as well. Um, I don't mean to uh, indicate that all things are boring in the market. We've had plenty of volatility for quite some time. Uh, this week has been modestly positive. There are these other events and company particular things that we have to pay attention to. As always, we're very uh, pleased to see uh, continued warm appetite around the emerging markets, particularly the way in which we're invested in them. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it for the week. Uh, let me do this. I will come back to you next week with another video, uh, as we always do, laying out what we are seeing in the market, what we're seeing in the economy, what we're paying attention to, what our big priorities are. 
Uh, earnings growth, Q1, we'll start to get a feel for that in about a month. And then uh, from about the middle of April to middle of May, we'll get a feel for what earnings growth did in Q1 versus the year prior. But um, I, I reiterate some things I said last week, and I have some new data about it this week, and including a chart, by the way, at Dividend Cafe. Look, 23 of the last 30 times that earnings were down year over year in the S&P, the S&P's price level was actually higher at the end of the year. So we want earnings going higher, but transitory interruptions for a quarter or whatnot are, have not historically indicated uh, pandemonium in markets. Um, the fact of the matter is that we really had a significant baseline jump higher in earnings a year ago, and growing on top of that denominator with various headwinds around the Fed and, and the government shutdown and uh, the China trade war, you know, is difficult. I think that it was a really positive fourth quarter result, and we're not interested in what the two-day, two-week, or two-month response to markets is in Q1 earnings, but we're prepared for all possible outcomes, and we'll then look at the facts and make the decisions around what we think is best in terms, from an asset allocation standpoint. But um, as far as the overall uh, temptation to try to guess what the earnings will be and how long it will last and what the market's response will be, we find all those things impossible to do and very unwise. So we're focused on the things that we can focus on, that we do focus on, and we think that will make a lot more sense. All right, I'm going to get back to it. Thank you very much, as always, for viewing the Dividend Cafe. Please reach out with any questions, any comments, anytime.